We're now um, going to have a session of question and answers. There's been quite a lot of uh, lively discussion uh, on the chat, and uh, myself and Raphael, if you's around, are going to pose questions for our panel. So could, could we now bring in the panel? I've got, uh, hopefully, Francois, uh, Jim, Roland, and Matt, and Becky, and possibly even Anthony. There was, there was a question here. Um, can you keep the cog material exposed internally, or does it always need a finishing layer such as clay plaster? And I know um, there is some variation within the pilot buildings. Um, who would like to respond to that? Yeah, I'm happy to answer, Tom. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you fine. Okay, so um, we, well, as we were building the, the Plymouth prototype, uh, we were looking at the internal face of the uh, Corbeau's walling. It, it, it can, <laughs> to some people, it could be quite an attractive feature for the university who require a certain standard within all of their buildings. They require sort of a more clean, uh, finished uh, appearance to them. They decided that we needed to go for an internal clay plaster. Um, I don't see why you couldn't leave it exposed in the future. If you had a client who particularly liked the finish, you end up, because you, you, we were using a mesh formwork, you end up with the, um, the lines of the mesh formwork uh, indented within uh, the, the cob surface. And to some, I, I, I quite liked it, so I don't see why you couldn't leave it like that. One issue, though, is the air tightness. I mean, one of the three reasons we've got the clay plaster, the clay plaster on the inside is to, to create a better, you know, air tightness in the building. Because I think um, we'll, we would have much more leakage if we didn't have that clay plaster. <clears throat> I would also add to just uh, touch upon uh, Matt and Anthony's answer is that yes, the removal of the formwork leaves this kind of mesh trace uh, on the wall. So if you plan to leave um, the cob apparent, it's uh, best to get rid of it and remove the formwork earlier when the cob is fresh. And then you can really rework that um, cob excess and get something that looks a little cleaner. And this would also mean uh, that later on, we need to fill in the micro gaps, micro cracks and gaps um, and holes that are left by the metal rods um, to, to ensure that air tightness that Anthony mentioned. It's something that we mentioned when we were working on the prototype in Normandy and we realized during the air tightness tests that these micro cracks or um, holes from the uh, metal rods to help fix the formwork were um, issues for air tightness. So we really had to fill them in using an earth mortar, using the same soil that was used for the wall. And so you can fill up these holes uh, in a quite aesthetic manner and have a wall that remains quite raw in terms of finish. Um, and therefore would need to be validated by uh, the client, for example, uh, who would accept this kind of finish. Well, just to say also that different mesh sizes are available and you can also put a geotextile inside, which will still give you an impression of the mesh, but um, without the cob material being able to push out between the, the holes of the mesh. So there's a lot of different finishes and playing around that can be done with this as a... Um, uh, as a way of building. And I think as always with, with cob finishes, timing is, is everything in terms of its uh, plasticity. Now I see th there's a few questions here which are starting to go into the um, the design aspects. Uh, Matthew Austin, I see you one. We'll maybe carry those over to this afternoon which focuses on uh, design. But there's one here um, which uh, was asking, how are the holes made by the metal rods which maintain the frames during construction uh, then filled? Uh, this one for Roland or Francois? Yes, so it's quite easy to get rid of the metal rods from the formwork um, and the, the, the mix takes well quite a lot of time to dry, especially at the heart of the wall, so you can quite easily pull these uh, metal rods out. But then the question, I think, is about the filling of the hole that is produced and um, the, the, the filling is oh. done with the same mix material. Yes. So, oh, yeah. 
So it's the exact same soil, not necessarily the exact same mix, because the, the initial mix is quite rich in fiber and, and it's quite dense and plastic. So you would use the same soil and then you could rework that into a mortar and add a little bit more sand, for example, and then would, this would make it less greasy. And then you can use this to fill the holes or the cracks um, that are on the wall. I'd just also like to, on, on the Plymouth building, we, um, we had a lean mix of, um, of the thermal mixture. So um, the slip with uh, lighter, uh, sort of the uh, hemp fibers, and they, we had the contractor uh, push that material in with like a screwdriver uh, from both sides um, until they couldn't get any more in. <laughs> um, Becky, there's one here, uh, I think, asking about the um, the hot lime and so on. Do you see those in the chat? There's one or two asking about lime. Can we, do you want to um, expand on that? I know just from conservation practice that hot lime is definitely the, the go-to for, for lime renders in Scotland where it rains a lot uh, because they are most um, breathable. Um, and I think Jim explained the scientific stuff better than I can. Um, so a hot lime mix is uh, basically you take quick lime from a kiln and kibbled quick lime is small part, you know, small nuggets of quick lime. It's very reactive with water, but when you make hot lime, you mix the, the quick lime with sand uh, in this case, it was roughly one part quick climb to three parts coarse, sharp sand. I think we also had some marble dust in it. And then you slake the materials together. And when you slake them together, it's, it gets very hot. But because the sand is in the mix, it's also easy to control the mix. Obviously, you're wearing protection, glasses and gloves. Um, but it's uh, relatively easy to do in a bell mixer or a, any kind of mixer, really. And it makes beautiful, workable, sticky, um, and ultimately breathable material. Francois, uh, I wonder if you want to pose some of the questions which have come in in French. Yes, um, I, I can uh, tell you about this. I, I've been answering in the chat, but. Uh, <laughs> that this means some of our English speakers might not understand that the different specificities, but um, so in terms of questions around insurances, uh, around cobbles processes, so this, this um, is specific to the French context and French regulations. So here we, we mentioned the cobbles technique and it uses an earthen material that at present is not described by any specific standards and will not receive uh, a specific regulation or standard because it varies from one place to another depending on the soil that is available. So generally here we use um, good practice guides that exist in France and this allows insurers to follow uh, and ensure that the work of companies and um, architects who will be designing with this process. Or we can also use um, ATEX, um, so experimental technical advice for public buildings, uh, regulations. I don't know if you've got an equivalent in Britain, if you can quite easily use these different um, cob techniques or this specific cobbage technique? No answer on your part, Tom, Roland. Sorry, sorry, Francois, what, what was that question? So the question was uh, around regulations for building to that, like the, the process that could limit building with cob. Is it similar in the UK compared to what's in France? Yeah, it's maybe slightly a question for this afternoon and on the design side, um, but uh, obviously we, we have built two buildings, so it is possible to get it through, uh, I guess, particularly the building regulations uh, system. Uh, Anthony, do you want to respond to that? We have a tradition, obviously, of cob building and, uh, and, and adobe um, block building in UK, 
the the Adobe in obviously in eastern region of England and uh, Cobb in the west. So the building inspectors for building regulations are very familiar with the material. And for our build, which you will see this afternoon in Norfolk, um, built, uh, we had no problems at all getting through building regulations and, um, and, and, and giving them confidence that this was okay. Um, the question about, um, and obviously we are therefore, we've also checked this with our professional indemnity insurers, and they're very happy for us to cover the, um, the build. Um, we've also actually agreed to do a collateral warranty um, for the builders we're working with at the moment in Norfolk. Uh, they are approaching, they haven't uh, got one yet, they're approaching a mortgage um, company, it's the ecological uh, mortgage company, um, and they're, you know, uh, they're, they, they seem fairly confident they'll get a mortgage for, for a Cobbage building, which is very good news. There was also a question around drying time. And so they, won they were wondering if you could keep building um, the, the works while things were drying. So can you keep working on the roof, for example, or um, putting in electricity, for example? Uh, I can pick up on that one. Um, so. Yeah, when we finished uh, the Cobbage walling on the Plymouth prototype, uh, immediately after the walling was finished, we laid the roof uh, construction and we managed to complete the wiring. So the first fix electrical, uh, we managed to complete the insulation to the ceiling, uh, the, the roof finish, the guttering and all of the other bits and pieces. So yeah, it's, it's perfectly plausible to continue working on the Cobbage building whilst you wait for the walls to dry out. Um, the, the drying stage is probably the most critical aspect of a cobbage building, uh, much in the same way that you would find with a traditional cob building. Um, but yeah. I think it might be worth pointing out that although the walls might take quite a long time to dry out, within a week or so, they start to firm up dramatically so they can take the loads of the roof long before they finish drying out. So that is one of the reasons why um, you can continue to build even while the walls are still drying. But you do have to allow for the shrinkage. I mean, uh, Jim has done some really interesting uh, monitoring of the shrinkage and the, therefore the roof actually lowering itself on the cobbage supporting walls, um, which makes it really important that you, and we'll go through this a little bit more in detail this afternoon, that you allow for that shrinkage around windows, particularly in the vertical dimension, and also for any internal walls. You have, if they're not also of Cobo, of, of, of an earth, and, and they say are oh, softwood, you, you obviously aren't going to get any shrinkage in those. So you've got to have some detail, which we'll show you this afternoon, about allowing for that shrinkage to happen so you can get on with the interior fit out. Yeah, just, just picking up on that, Anthony, in an ideal world, you would wait and, and not order your windows and doors until um, this, this, a certain amount of shrinkage and settlements had occurred. Um, we certainly found with the Cobbage building, we didn't have the luxury of uh, waiting to place the order. Uh, the lead-in times for timber windows, uh, especially triple glazed timber windows that you're buying in from around Europe, uh, was uh, at least six months and the uh, program didn't allow us the time to kind of complete and allow for that shrinkage to take place. So we had to place the order for the windows. But Anthony's absolutely right. We allowed for 40 millimeters of clearance above the head of the windows to allow for a degree of shrinkage. Um, and I can agree that uh, it was a slightly nervous moment uh, as I could see the, the, the roof and the, the heads of the walls uh, settling. <laughs> Excellent. Okay, well, I think that, that sort of neatly leads us on to this afternoon's uh, design session. I think we'll draw this morning's sessions to a close now and uh, reconvene in 45 minutes.